certainly what I would hope to see or what yeah. I would predict to see, but eh, it's better than what a lot of people realize. Uh, and I want to say, uh, and I think um, my colleague, uh, Professor Ma, will agree with me, uh, you really, you know, you need to look at a lot of different measures. So I want to look at some other measures than the ones you did. Okay. Um, first, uh, whoops, looks like this isn't working, so, um, hmm? How do we advance the slides? Okay. Uh, so first, I want to say that uh, things are getting worse in Hong Kong, and, um, uh, you know, we have independent evidence to show that. So if we take the Freedom House data of political rights and civil liberties, uh, which range from one to seven on two different scales, and we just uh, standardize it zero to 100 with 100 is best, you can see you know, what I think most people would agree, freedom is declining in Hong Kong. Really, uh, there hasn't been much change on the political rights front. Uh, structurally, things are what they've been, and the tragedy is that they're not getting better. What's going on with Freedom House documents, we've heard references to it, including in the very good, and I'd say somewhat uh, subtle uh, presentation on censorship, but, you know, uh, look at the universities, look at a lot of different dimensions, is that civil liberties are declining in Hong Kong. And the rule of law is declining in Hong Kong. Uh, and I think maybe it's not as dramatic and it's not as overt as the worst fears in 1997. Reality is often more subtle and incremental, but um, this is not a good trend. Uh, it's, I think, in some of the you know, m more dramatic instances, it's an alarming trend. And I think it is likely to get worse as more and more institutional players uh, think that, uh, uh, you know, one country, two systems is in fact, uh, as uh, Martin Lee uh, suggested, and uh, Jasper Chang, as you uh, uh, seem, uh, if I'm misquoting you, um, please correct me, but as you seem to agree with him, it's kind of eroding. Uh, and uh, my prediction is it will further erode. In any case, this is one independent assessment. Uh, we could have others. Uh, these are the trends uh, according to the World Bank measure of voice and accountability, which uh, includes uh, the Freedom House measure, but many others as well. And just note from 2012 to 2016, really an even more dramatic decline in Hong Kong, whereas actually Taiwan has been improving in recent years and China is just uh, not getting better. Um, now, uh, okay, now it's working. So now we get to the public opinion data. And I want to look at, see, I think it's very hard to measure in China what people really think. Because the minute you start talking about the Communist Party, are you patriotic or not? Uh, do you love our system or not? I mean, you know, who's going to really disagree with that? It's like somebody uh, calling from the Levada Center on the telephone in Moscow and saying, do you approve or disapprove of the way Vladimir Putin is handling his job? Well, you know, I, I want to suggest there's a certain percentage, unknowable but more than trivial uh, percentage of the Russian public that isn't going to reveal uh, if they do, in fact, not approve of the way Vladimir Putin is handling his job. But when you get to these basic value dimensions about democracy, uh, I think people are more likely to give an honest answer. And here, um, I think there is some evidence it is mixed. It is not uniform. It isn't pretty and uh, consistent the way I, as a modernization theorist, would like to see. But there's some evidence, uh, and I'll summarize it in a more dramatic way in, a, in another slide or two, that uh, attitudes and values in mainland China are becoming more democratic over time, that there's you know, a kind of level of basic orientation toward democracy that I would summarize it this way, and I'll show it to you in a future slide, is actually roughly similar to where Taiwan was in 1984 
And if I were Xi Jinping, actually, I would worry about that. Um, and so if you ask people, should the government, this is, these are all democratic responses, okay? To have a democratic response, you have to disagree with each of these authoritarian or Asian values, value statement. Uh, when d judges decide important cases, they should accept the view of the executive branch. Well, 43% of the mainland Chinese sample disagreed with that in 2016. Government should decide which ideas can be discussed. 50% disagree. And, you know, on these measures, again, it's not perfect, but the Hong Kong sample is, is pretty democratic. Not quite as much as Taiwan, but sometimes more than Korea. And, you know, it's kind of messy and it varies. Now, um, here's my point. If you look at Taiwan in 1984 for the four items that we have data, uh, and how things have changed in Taiwan and then study change in mainland China. You know, on, on some of these items, uh, the mainland Chinese sample is more democratic uh, in their basic value orientations than the public in Taiwan was in 1984. I just show this to say, I think modernization is already having an impact, and I don't think we can say there's no basis culturally for future democratic change in China. So here's all the items we have that I think could reflect these kind of tradition Asian, uh, traditional Asian values. You want to make these slides available uh, to people, uh, Ming, you're welcome to do so. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it real simple for you. If you average all of those and just ask what is the overall average level of agreement with the democratic orientation, which is disagreement with the value proposition, you see, again, it's not what I would hope for, but it is a positive trend. The average kind of democratic value orientation in China has gone from 43% in 2002 to about 47% in 2008 and 2011 to 48% in 2016. Now, is that bad news because it's not improving very much, or is it good news because it's now nearly half the public? Uh, well, it's obviously, we don't have the data here, but I, I think you can imagine, uh, very educated people, more urban people, are more likely to have these democratic orientations. And China is becoming more educated and more urban and higher income. So I think over time this will gradually improve as it did um, in Taiwan over time, if you take an average there. Now, I'll just take a few minutes to reflect on some other things uh, that have been said. Um, first of all, uh, I am not optimistic about one country, two systems. I, I think that Democrats in Hong Kong should make it clear that they are committed to one country, and I am really deeply worried about the pro-independence, you know, particularly radical articulation of the localist movement. Many of the localists, uh, particularly the young people, were veering in a, in a rather more militant direction, are my friends. I have a lot of admiration and affection for them. Whatever they feel in their hearts, I, I just think this is strategically a massively stupid uh, 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 decision or political uh, strategy to articulate a, a pro-independence uh, sentiment or anything that um, reflects a demeaning uh, of China, uh, a gratuitous insult uh, to the People's Republic of China. I think it is really, uh, as a matter of political tactics and strategy, deeply unwise for two reasons. Uh, one is, I think it is likely to provoke uh, greater uh, political retaliation and repression from Beijing, as we witnessed with the disqualification of some of the yet newly elected members of the LegCo, who were seen to not have taken the oath of office with sufficient fidelity to uh, the wording of the oath or underlying respect for one country, two systems, and, and for the People's Republic of China. What do you really gain by that? Um, I think the cost 
in my mind as a scholar of democratization is uh, much greater than the symbolic benefit. But the second thing speaks to the fundamental kind of strategic point I would make here. I don't think the cause of democratization in China can in, in Hong Kong can succeed without affecting and bringing along public opinion in mainland China. That's my fundamental point. And so if you alienate public opinion in mainland China, including people in mainland China who would like to see their political system move in a more democratic direction, maybe incrementally, but nevertheless, and you think, wow, they're insulting us. Why should we support them or identify with them? It, it just is not a good strategy. It's not productive. Um, and I have seen something happening in Taiwan that I think is indicative of this same problem, this same trend. You know, Taiwan has the, a lot of mainland Chinese uh, young people have been going to Taiwan. I think the number is starting to decline now for the reason I'm going to articulate. But they've been going to Taiwan. They've been studying in Taiwan. Well, here's a massive opportunity, right? to uh, inculcate in these mainland Chinese students, many of whom will return to China, a positive view of democracy, a positive view of political pluralism and freedom, uh, and hopefully a positive view of Taiwan, so they'll go back and maybe be voices for greater restraint and patience in terms of Beijing's attitude toward Taiwan. So, you know, when they go there and they meet disrespect, uh, militant Taiwanese independent sentiment, and um, just a climate of hostility, frankly. What is that going to do for uh, comedy and cross-strait relations, for uh, the projection of sympathy toward democratic values? Many of these young people in the mainland are going back with a very hostile view of Taiwan uh, and a very hostile view, maybe, of, of democracy and political pluralism. It's really deeply unfortunate. And I don't think Democrats in Taiwan, uh, I put it in the same category, are really uh, thinking very strategically. Now, when you're emotional, you're angry, you're frustrated, uh, you don't think analytically. Often you think emotionally. But thinking emotionally may be satisfying it's not smart politics. I want to say uh, that um, I think it is increasingly the case that the situation in Hong Kong resembles, I am sorry, I apologize for uh, uh, making reference to this statement, but I am increasingly compelled uh, to feel as I watch what is happening in Hong Kong uh, in terms of the uh, mobilizations for freedom and the defense of civil liberties uh, and the increasing, er increasingly arrogant and nasty response to this by the Beijing authorities and the increasing, we need to really stress this, concentration and personalization of political power in Beijing, which I think has been definitely codified and advanced by uh, what has happened at the 19th Party Congress. The increasing turn to ideology, uh, to um, uh, nationalism, uh, even of a fairly crude nature, cult of personality, the kinds of things that we really haven't seen since the Mao era. But I think we're nicely illustrated by the six pictures of Xi Jinping that went up on the screen at one point during the day. If you put that together, you know, with the idea of one country, two systems, and with the traditions of rule of law and at least civil and intellectual pluralism and freedom in Hong Kong, I think, you know, I am tempted to recall uh, the speech of Abraham Lincoln in 1858 uh, in the United States, uh, not too long in advance of the Civil War, actually, when he said, um, this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I believe it will become all one thing or all the other. And when Xi Jinping talks about um, organic integration, 
of Hong Kong with the mainland. I don't think the one thing that he has in mind is the democratization of the mainland. I think the one thing he has in mind is that increasingly, in reality, in a creeping fashion, with that frog experiencing slightly warmer temperatures every passing year, Hong Kong's civil liberties, Hong Kong's tradition of uh, intellectual, uh, media, uh, and social and organizational pluralism and freedom will degrade by degree uh, after degree after degree. Uh, and of course, um, the more radical the opposition, the more uh, this process, I think, will uh, accelerate. Now, I'll just close by uh, saying that it seems to me, uh, and I would add, uh, Benny, that in addition to um, Mr. Moyer, I think the Hong Kong uh, democracy movement could benefit from studying more broadly tactics of nonviolent civil resistance. There's a whole kind of wider literature on the website of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. Uh, and I would summarize some of the lessons from that and from uh, successful uh, bottom-up movements for democratic change by, by conveying a few obvious lessons. Number one, if you are in a bind as a pro-democracy movement, and you're trying to move things forward, uh, it is very important to unify your ranks. And the more divided the ranks, the more it is a gift to the authoritarian ruling elite. Secondly, the strategy has to be to divide the um, uh, ruling authoritarian establishment, uh, both uh, now because it's not only a two-level game, elite and mass, it's a two-realm game inside Hong Kong, but also inside the People's Republic of China. That yields four boxes, and I'm suggesting the box of public opinion in mainland China should not be ignored. I think in the long run it's going to be really important. And that means um, pulling away people from this um, solidarity behind Xi Jinping within the party and in the wider society, and coming to have a more flexible and maybe even in some ways friendly and envious attitude once again uh, to political pluralism and freedom uh, in Hong Kong. I can't say uh, what uh, the specific tactics are uh, that follow from that. I don't know enough about Hong Kong and it's really not my place to do so, but I think um, it isn't hopeless because I think authoritarian rule in China, while it is more authoritarian than it was a year or two years or five years ago, while it seems like it's more of an ever more powerful and global, globally rising juggernaut than it was even a few years ago, while China is rapidly becoming uh, a superpower peer of the United States and will in the next few years become the largest <coughs> economy in the world, even in nominal dollars, uh, and its technological uh, edge is, in, is increasing, um, or technological prowess, let's say, uh, is increasing very rapidly. There are also very serious uh, underlying vulnerabilities uh, in mainland China including uh, in the political economy, the deep corruption in the system. I think there is at least a lot of truth in what uh, uh, Minchin Pei has written about crony capitalism. And in a regime that may look unified now, but you've got to know it's got a lot of people in it, um, uh, in strategic places, who cannot be happy uh, at this deinstitutionalizing, amassing, of personal uh, and even cult of personality power by Xi Jinping. So I think there's also got to be a certain element of strategy that involves strategic patience in terms of, of waiting for uh, these cracks uh, to surface in the authoritarian monolith that is uh, Xi Jinping's seeming, but I think not total personal control 
of the system. So I hope I've laid enough on the table to maybe allow for a glimmer of hope and at least 25 minutes of conversation. Mm -hmm. Exactly 10 years ago, when I was about to conclude the Hong Kong SIR First Decade Symposium, I did personally feel a note of optimism. And to be honest, that optimism is not easy to be justified today. But I had a task for the panelists, the speakers. 10 years ago, after the conference, I compiled the book. China's Hong Kong transformed it. If I'm going to do a book based on today's proceeding, as well as the exchange they would have with their audience at Berkeley and UCLA, what the book title should be. China's Hong Kong deformed it, <laughs> discarded, or someone at lunchtime contacted, <coughs> or one of my former students sat along this way. China's Hong Kong mainland dies. And some even with combines, <laughs> all sorts of adjectives. So instead of just reconstraining the discussion, I need every one of you to give me a little bit feedback. Suppose we do bring out another book, and of course I would not dare to use the yellow, otherwise people for I'm not <laughs> blue. I object to I would probably use red, blue. just like blue. my left eye. Blue. Oh. Mm -hmm. blue. Well, that would really be politically neutral. Yeah, because uh, my most famous book in China in Hong Kong was The British Sunset Turned Hong Kong Red, Lock, yeah, Hong Kong Home. So, because I couldn't use blue, I couldn't use Yellow, I could use green. Otherwise, people say, oh, Ming Chen, you are anti Taiwan independence, but you use green, right? Or maybe a little bit pink? I don't know. But what should the title of this continuous symposium should be called? I need your help. And on this note, we have exactly 25 minutes or 23 minutes because I must. I join this meeting shortly at 5.30 because I have an appointment with a lady. My mom, she's 98, and I visit her every day dinner time without fail, and I don't want to make an exception today, although I will be a bit later. So everyone who wants to say something, this is your last 23 minutes. Can I ask you a question? Come in. <laughs> it's very hot inside, so I just stay here. <laughs> I have two questions for Professor Larry. Um, the first question is, uh, you talk about the case in uh, the uh, mainland students who visit and study in uh, Taiwan, and then they might uh, have some, uh, you know, uh, 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 some good influence on their uh, uh, opinion on democracy. But I would uh, argue that if you read some uh, research on these uh, uh, students and also you will, uh, if you talk to them you will find uh, it's, it's not uh, always true because you can find that they, only the, the students who live in, uh, after they are studied in, in the US or in, the, uh, in Taiwan, people, students who live and who uh, find a good job and uh, live in the US or in, the, in Taiwan, they are capable to do that compared to the peer group who returned to the mainland, that's a totally different uh, group. So I think in, from this point, uh, we cannot uh, be so optimistic uh, because they are not capable. They, they, in their mind, they still have the, you know, they, they, when they, they, their old ideas when they, uh, uh, when they uh, you know, studied in mainland, sorry. But, the second question is: You talk about the non-violence in um, in the movement, uh, in non-violence non uh, movement in Hong Kong. But in in case of uh, Liu Xiaobo's uh, experience, can you still so optimistic? Thank you. I think you should, given the limits on time, collect the funds. Yes. Comments. Second question. No one care to make a comment or question? Mang, I have a 
global and theoretical question for Larry. Uh, uh, continuing on your theme of authoritarianism goes global, that we are witnessing a trend of like a global recession or global rise of authoritarian models. New Would you see there's a danger that there will be also a change towards more acceptance of authoritarian values or alternatives all over the world? Or would you always believe that the forces of modernization would triumph? Third question. Uh, Larry, you want to Another question? Yes? Speak louder, please. Who among the younger generation will be invited for the next conference? <laughs> I will be in charge. <laughs> because the next conference at the earliest should be the 25th anniversary, the midpoint of the 50 year no change. If that 50 year no change is still recognized, accepted, and honored by whoever would be in charge. So I'm not at any position to promise, to project, or to think because I am exhausted. That's why I declined Berkeley's invitation to be there tomorrow, nor UCLA's invitation to be there on Wednesday, and then I'm not flying to Toronto for the Friday conference. So in some sense, for a person who got his PhD 42 years ago, and my fit for retirement, but it's true. So it's the younger generation, Andy and many other people, even Wong San, after you are mainlander but sympathetic under them, maybe you people could cook up a proposal and see what would be the leadership figure of Hong Kong youth and even mainland youth that you want to invite if Stanford is still able to hold a conference sometime five years from now, ten years from now, and I'm sure some of us would already be retired, and we, we would be lucky if we were still alive by then. So, any substantive question, particularly to the most senior sinologists in the audience, who is Lin Wei from Princeton? I already answered some of the things. So I want to add one more, uh, specifically for Professor Diamond. So you propose a very interesting strategy uh, for the democratic movement uh, in Hong Kong uh, by saying that uh, people in Hong Kong should consider the public opinion in mainland China. But given that, in my opinion, Xi Jinping has become increasingly more popular because of his very successful personalization strategy, does that mean that it will be even more difficult for Hong Kong to gain support from the mainland public uh, if there's anything that is even close to uh, a, demo, a more democratic system? We have quite a few on your plate. So Larry, try to wrap up in 10 minutes. Well, I, I don't think I'll need that. And I know Lynn is uh, going to want to address some of these as well, and is probably better able to address the last one in particular. Um, of course, it is not always the case, and it would be just ridiculously simplistic to say, you know, students uh, go abroad from an authoritarian country like China, they go to a democracy, whether it's the U.S. or now Taiwan or Europe or Australia, they get democratized, they go back and they change their country. Um, we know it's much more complicated than that, and it's much more varied than that. And of course, it is the case that a growing number of people, um, and probably the ones who are more ironically more democratically inclined, may stay uh, in the U.S. or, or elsewhere. Um, so I think we need a lot more research, of course. Um, I am aware 
of some of the research that sheds light on, uh, you know, some of the simplicity uh, and specious nature of that kind of straw man uh, thesis. But, I mean, just use elementary logic. If people are treated badly and they go back uh, and they are become the victim of a kind of nationalist wave of um, ethnic hostility or nationalistic hostility, they're going to have a more negative view about um, both the place where they've been studying and maybe about democracy in general than if there's at least an effort to engage, show mutual respect, subtly develop uh, a certain human solidarity and common grounds of uh, connection. I, I just put that out there. Uh, with respect to nonviolence, uh, look, uh, I am not um, uh, saying that people should uh, put themselves out for uh, slaughter. I have never uh, been one to, you know, call on uh, people within mainland China to violate the law, put themselves at risk. Uh, that is a uh, strategy that every person needs to weigh for himself or herself. It's not for me to call on people to take risks that I myself don't have to take. I would like to say this, however. Um, I think it's a pretty well-documented fact that a lot of people in, young people in China don't know who Lu Xiaobo is, don't know what happened in Tiananmen Square in 1989, and are uh, shockingly ignorant of the human rights and democratic struggles and recent history under Chinese communist rule in their own country. And I have to wonder, you know, I have to wonder, with all of the technical sophistication in Hong Kong in Taiwan, uh, whether uh, there aren't more creative means of scaling the Great Firewall and raising political consciousness in China than have so far been grasped. And I just say again, um, I think that the battle for democracy in Hong Kong must be a multi-front, multi-stage, long-term battle that in the end has to involve uh, public opinion uh, in China in a variety of ways. And I think that there are, you know, uh, there are tremendous obstacles to this, but I think that there are opportunities that creative minds uh, could discover. Let's just leave it at that. In terms of the moment we are at, I think it is globally a moment of a rapidly deepening democratic recession. I wouldn't say a yet what Huntington would call a reverse wave of democratic failures, but it's got a number of dimensions to it. Lynn mentioned several in terms of the retreat of democracy in a variety of places, including <coughs> European Union countries, including Hungary and Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a moment in which authoritarian countries, Russia and China in particular, are dramatically scaling up their projection of their own soft power. Uh, and that is mostly what we meant by the phenomenon in that edited book of authoritarianism going global. Fortunately, there is relatively little sign that it has become a winning strategy at the level of mass public opinion. Uh, they've been making a big effort in sub-Saharan Africa, and they have relatively little to show for it so far. I know because I look at the public opinion data in the Afrobarometer, and basically support for democracy and liberal values in sub-Saharan Africa is stunningly high, given how um, it's not a modernization story there, given how poor the continent is. And there's a lot of wariness of uh, Chinese foreign investment, uh, people coming in association with Chinese investment and then, you know, kind of insinuating themselves into the economy in a way that 
people feel has a taint, frankly, of neo-colonialism to it. Uh, and so it's a complicated picture, but you know, China's in it for the long run. They have a lot of money to spend on this. They're sending a lot of African young people to China. The study of Chinese language is uh, expanding a lot uh, among uh, a lot of young people in Africa, Latin America, elsewhere, as you know. And so, you know, I don't want to be cavalier about this. I, I don't know what uh, the long term uh, will bring. I do believe that we need in the United States and in other democracies of the world a very concerted, very coherent, very comprehensive pushback against uh, this projection of Chinese soft power. And I think if CNN um, and some of the other uh, uh, Western media networks uh, and enterprises are not freely available in China, we should ask questions about whether Chinese television should be so, uh, CGTV, so freely available uh, in the United States. I simply uh, raise that point. Kevin asked about the relationship between nationalism and support for democracy. I think your point is very well taken. And so again, yes, historically, psychologically, emotionally, it's a very natural and understandable reaction to say uh, that China has been the source of authoritarianism, uh, and so we have to project this uh, different form of national identity, alternative form, and that is inextricably intertwined with democracy. I understand the emotion behind it. I understand the history behind it. I'm just repeating, it's not a smart political strategy. It's going to push people, first of all, it's going to alienate um, uh, the political leadership in Beijing even further. I think it's got the potential to bring a national tragedy upon the people of Taiwan down the road. Uh, and it's going to alienate public opinion in mainland China that is increasingly nationalistic. Why would you want to do that? Um, so I realize she is becoming more popular in China. I concede that. Um, China is becoming more nationalistic um, with very effective mobilization in that regard by the Chinese Communist Party and by President uh, Xi himself. So I think Democrats in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in China itself, in exile in the diaspora from China and elsewhere just need to stand back and reboot their whole strategy and philosophy to thinking about how can we engage and maybe engage for the long run to build on some of this value change without alienating people in China and saying, oh, you're really you know, just a corrupt, failed system. You should be ashamed of your system and you know, come over to our side. Well, that's not a winning, uh, winning line. So how can we develop some lines of communication and engagement that don't put people on the defensive and open space for them to go in a different direction when this deeply corrupt and authoritarian political system hits a serious bump in the road, which I think it's going to do sooner or later. Lynn, could you have just three minutes to do your well, final benediction? Maybe if you take you know five. if you take two uh, yes I will uh, <laughs> uh, if you take two American liberals and ask the questions about the authoritarian flow that seems to be prominent in Thailand, in Turkey, in Cambodia, an egregious case just recently, uh, in China, the Philippines, lots of other countries, are uh, you? going to get somewhat similar answers, and I agree with practically everything that, uh, I think I do agree with everything that Larry said. Um, I am for elections, and I'm very much for rule of law that Martin Lee eloquently talked about early in the, in the morning. Just to vary the uh, tone a bit, let me raise some concerns about a hope that many Democrats in Hong Kong had that they, that Hong Kong might be a beacon for all of China. 
Indeed, I hope that it would be, and I hope that elections could move uh, freely into China. But since Liu Xiaobo was mentioned, let me point out that Charter 08 was very careful about holding elect about the dangers of holding elections too soon in China. I am concerned too that elections uh, in Hong Kong, later influencing elections in China, could prove dangerous to mainland elections themselves. The connection between nationalism and democracy, or indeed, and authoritarianism, uh, was discussed. A patriotic demagogue in China might see that he could win mainland elections, especially after an attack on Taiwan. I hope that this doesn't happen. I hope that Mr. Xi and his successor, if he has one, I think he will, um, don't turn out to be such a demagogue. But we have experience from in many countries. Uh, Andrew Jackson in the United States a long time ago, a patriot, a Democrat, winner of the Battle of New Orleans, uh, very anti-Indian, very racist, uh, very much a, a demagogue and a killer. Uh, was was an example. There are Hitler and Mussolini are examples of nationalist demagogues, uh, populist, populist demagogues. If such a person were elected, or saw that he it would probably be he, could win mainland elections, might try to arrange that. That would be dangerous. Uh, Chinese courts would be almost surely not strong enough to prevent a chauvinist dictator like that from repressing all Chinese liberals on the mainland, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, wherever else it could. Judiciaries in early democratizations have often proved to be too weak, too politicized to stop such a person. Some in Beijing have already expressed positive interest in Hitler's communitarian jurist, Karl Schmidt. Chinese liberalism, I think, eventually will be safe for the reasons of increasing diversity and what I call modernity broadly, or referring to Lipset, um, as China becomes richer. But I don't think it will be very safe until representatives of labor can negotiate seriously with the party which now represents capital, rather than representing the proletariat. On that, I'd cite comparatives named Reuschmeyer and Stevens, if you're interested in that. I think that eventually there will be extensions of participation in Chinese politics and Hong Kong politics, uh, extension to popular sovereignty, and this will be a good thing. But how it happens could vary a, a great deal. And one of the concerns, I've got to express this, about opinion polls is that they are taken in the context of decisions that, that elites uh, have made, either to act or not to act, and that they could change very fast. I think Larry might not disagree with that. Um, eventually, I think that popular sovereignty will become more important in Hong Kong and in China. But the road between here and there could be bumpy, and I certainly hope uh, that it isn't. On that not so bumpy road, and thank God the rain didn't come down, so we may have a 1% optimism against the rather 99% dark, dark cloud overhanging Hong Kong and hope our speakers could return safely up the US area of Toronto and hope some of you who have political agenda won't be disqualified. <laughs> and hopefully, Bendy Tai would remain a free person. <laughs> Particularly, it's nasty when you were more brilliant than a former classmate at Hong Kong New Law School Yet that nasty person tried to fix you by putting you in jail. I'm glad I didn't graduate from the University of Hong Kong because that is a horrible alumni relationship. <laughs> <laughs> On this note, I hope someone would have the tenacity, wisdom, resources to mark five years from now the Hong Kong 25th anniversary, ten years from now the Hong Kong SAR, if they remain then a Hong Kong SAR, still one country, what, one and a half, one point two three system to talk about. And I'm too old to receive the mandate, nor to carry out the task, because honestly, 
maybe I'm getting old, maybe this is too complicated task. I had not been able to catch up with Hong Kong newspaper in the last three, four days because I had to adjust to many last minute adjustments associated with this campus, Berkeley, UCLA and Toronto. And I am grateful despite the imperfection on my part, all the speakers outperformed themselves and your attention was extremely appreciated because it's a top story, 9 to 5.30, and we don't pay you OT. <laughs> As for the speakers and panelists, listen. Since I had to exit now, Andy Lu and Wang San, two Stanford PhD students, would help to coordinate Mr. Ken Chen and Mr. Stanley Lam on top of Professor Larry Diamond, Professor Sun, would have enough auto <coughs> space to take you to the farewell dinner <coughs> location. And I hope, Andy, did you get my Uber? Yeah, uh, it's arriving in five minutes. Okay. Uh -huh. So, any final, final question, not to me, but the two distinguished senior scholars? A one minute comment is welcome, or tell me what should the new book title be called? <laughs> I think we should just thank Ming Chen for organizing us all. There was a book about the Japanese occupation, so I should not want to eclipse. Maybe it's the final sunset of Hong Kong? <laughs> if you remain free one year from now, then I could get a little bit optimism on the book title. Thank you for being so caring and laughing about Hong Kong. And on behalf of all the speakers, I thank you, the charity of the audience attention, and you justify our being here. Thank you. Thank you.